Mr. Stephen Campbell at the RSVP Office of Catholic Services of Macomb, located at 26238 Ryan Road, Warren, Michigan. Mr. Campbell was 85 years of age and was born August 27, 1926. Mr. Campbell currently resides at 38879 Creekwig Circle, Clinton Township, Michigan, 48036. My name is James Buckley. I will be the interviewer. And Marilyn, excuse me, Marilyn Ridlicki will be our videographer today. Okay, Mr. Campbell, would you, for the record, uh, please state the branch of service you served in? The Army. Okay. U.S. Army. U.S. Army. Okay, so uh, why don't we just start off uh, today and kind of tell us a little bit about, uh, see here from your bio information that you were uh, born in Nova Scotia. Right. So kind of from that point on, we'll okay. get started. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I was born in Nova Scotia in uh, Cape Britain Island on uh, August the 27th in 1926. I uh, finished high school and uh, after I finished high school I uh, went to uh, the Canadian National Railway Station to learn telegraphy and I became a telegrapher which took approximately one year. And I worked in uh, Nova Scotia as a telegrapher until about 1950. And at that time, they, there was a shortage of uh, telegraphers at the Grand Trunk Western in Michigan. And the Canadian National Railway owned the Grand Trunk Western. So there was a request came from the dispatcher, the chief dispatcher of the Grand Trunk Western Railroad in Michigan, down to our chief dispatcher in to Nova Scotia, wanting to know if there was certain, but maybe there were some people that would want to come up to work and fill those positions in Michigan. And was, you know, was that job that like a teletype operator or what? Well, what, 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 what is it? Uh, we eventually, you ever see you can go to a movie and see the guy with the gray, the green uh, visor and the, the yes. Well, that's a telegrapher. He takes train orders, you know, he always all in the movies we saw him after our train robbery when he was wiring ahead to the police to okay. stop the train and what have you, okay? <laughs> so the telegrapher is a guy that takes train orders for trains, meeting, passing, you know, or whatever, at some certain speed limits, that type of thing. And we had a red signal, which meant that the train would have to stop to pick up and sign the train orders, so they understood it. And we had a caution one, which we held up with a hoop up to the fireman or the engineer, and then also to the guy and the, the conductor in the uh, caboose, okay. okay? So basically we took messages from, uh, uh, we, we had uh, messages from our dispatcher from different uh, uh, other stations and sent messages and stuff like that. Made the books out at the end of every month for the to send into the auto department. So you were in one of the local stations then? Yes. Well, I was all over. When you first uh, graduate, uh, you're only working maybe two or three days a week because somebody got sick or something, or then as you grew over two or three years, you got a permanent position at a specific location. But I was at about 25 different depots while I was uh, in Nova Scotia to move around. So then about 1950 you ended up coming to the Michigan area? Is that yeah, right? due to the uh, request that the Chief Dispatcher of the Grand Trunk Western made, uh, there was three or four of us signed up and came into Detroit, Michigan. I came in on uh, about March the 30th of 1950, okay? And uh, I went to, to work for the uh, railroad here at the Grand Trunk Western. But needless to say, on the 25th of June, those declaration of war in Korea, which the Koreans were. Well, anyway, um, the word came out, and I guess it was really in the newspaper more or less, that there were now ha certain age groups had to uh, sign up for the draft. But that was the only thing. It was very, very plain. You know, it didn't give any restrictions or anything. So I went down and I registered. And uh, in about July, I guess it was, 
and uh, by September I had my first call, okay? So then uh, come uh, December, I got my second call. There was no interruption by the Grand Frank Western, you know, because I was going to the service or anything. They knew I was going, but there was no restriction as to, hey, we brought him in, you know, and he was working for us and we need him. So anyway, my second call asked me to report to uh, Fort Wayne in Detroit at, uh, on uh, June the, January the 9th in 2000, in uh, 1950, 1951. Right. And uh, from there, we... So, uh, just uh, to interrupt you one second, uh, you were a Canadian citizen. Oh, still? yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I became a, uh, an American citizen after I came back from uh, Korea. It took me about three months to... Uh, well, okay. By, by then, at that time, you were, you were a Canadian citizen. At that time, citizen. I was a, a Canadian citizen, but that never entered onto my uh, uh, records when I went down to sign up or to tr for report. If, for they, the if they would have known that, well, at the draft board, would they have, have drafted you? No, or, they, they wouldn't have. They would have accepted your... Yeah, they accepted uh, all the information whatever. I had. They didn't know that I was uh, still a Canadian citizen. It wasn't a part of the uh, description that you filled out. I see. Okay? But I wondered that when I saw this, I was going to ask you about yeah. it. What had happened is that uh, they, there was nothing mentioned at any of the uh, uh, times that I went from my first call and my second call. But when we departed out of Fort Wayne about the 10th or the 11th of January, we went to Fort uh, Sheridan, Illinois for, uh, for the music. But no, that was merely a, a place where they disposed of oh, you and, okay. sent, and sent you to the areas where you were going to be trained. So we were there, for, I think, for about a week, and they finally they sent uh, me and a group of other guys down to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, mm -hmm. down to the Ozarks, and we entered basic training as, uh, what do you call an engineer, what do you call an engineer that blows up mines? Demolition. 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 Yeah, we, we, a demolition engineer, we built pontoon bridges and, you know, <coughs> that kind of thing. That's the same outfit I was in. Was it? Through Fort Knox. And combat construction and also demolition expert. Yeah. It didn't last though once I left uh, basic <laughs> training. <laughs> so they, they, they train you for that, and then after you got out of basic, they, they reassign you and retrain you, I guess, is what you well, said. Well, right? what had happened is that uh, we got, re, uh, you know, our, we finished our training about uh, April, the last of April of uh, 51, and uh, we had our delay in route, which is about 30 day. To go, you know, say goodbye to everybody right. and that kind of a thing. So anyway, when we came back, uh, we uh, were sent out to Stoneman, California. That was our dis our disposal area where we were going to go. But we knew before we left basic training where we were going. We're either going to Germany or we were going to Korea. So I was assigned to the Eastern Eastern uh, Command, which meant Korea. So we ended in uh, Stoneman, California, and then in June of, uh, we left then for uh, seven, no, 11 day uh, sea on a, on a vessel or going to Yokohama, Japan. Okay. Well, did you go and get any additional training after basic? No. Well, we had, uh, the basic was the sixth week. Yeah, then you yeah. had an eight week of the of the we're training of the with the demolition with okay. the mines, pantroon bridges, you know that right. kind of a yeah. thing. Yeah, the, the advanced. And then when they shoot the, yeah. the sure. bullets over your head, and yeah. <laughs> all that good stuff. And then at that point, then you were deployed. Uh, yeah, we deployed to, uh, uh, over to uh, Korea. Korea. But uh, before that, when I was being processed in Fort Sheridan, Illinois, one of the uh, administrative uh, people that was signing, doing all my papers and everything, he says, he says, you're not a, you're, you're not an American citizen. He says, you shouldn't be going here. You shouldn't be here. He says, I'll set you up with a, 
with a meeting with a captain in the morning. So it's fine. I says, you know, so in the meantime, I, I never did tell him, but I had two brothers killed in World War II in Canada. And uh, he set me up with the captain and the captain gave me all the kinds of blue that you want to think about, talk about. He uh, says, uh, you know, even if you're not a citizen, you should, you know, you shouldn't turn you down the chance you've got, you know. That. So he talked and talked and talked, and finally I says, well, nobody's ever going to call me a coward. So I says, that, that's the end of the conversation. I says, I'll go. So I didn't make any rebuffs or anything like that, saying that I did, I wanted to get out or anything like that. So I see. Okay, well, at that point in time, were you... Uh Still single, or were oh yeah, you, were I, was, I was still single. I never, okay. I didn't get married when I came back from uh, Korea okay, a couple so. of years later. So you got you got past that point, and then uh, uh, you ended up uh, going directly to Korea. Well, no, we went to Yokohama, Japan, and okay. uh, we, uh, I guess, uh, we drew our M1 rifles, and we got some more clothing and stuff like that, and. Uh, and they put us on a train down from uh, where, where we're at, the Yokohama, down to Sasebo, Japan. That's where the ship, the, well, it wasn't a ship. The water was so thin there that they had to put you on a barge. And it took you about eight hours to go from Sasebo to Pusan, Korea, on, the, on this barge. Okay. Okay? And then we got on the barge and they went and they put us in a uh, barracks for two or three days, we zeroed in, I guess, our weapons and, you know, made sure. Right. And then our orders our orders came down and uh, we were going to go be trained, go by train over to the uh, the rep rep depot we called them at that time. I don't know what you call them, but there were rep depot where you went and you got your assignment at the rep depot. Well, the, the only problem was that when uh, we went uh, uh, on the train, it was a uh, wooden seated benches. There was absolutely no windows whatsoever in the train, absolutely none. And the Koreans never agreed to go around a mountain with a train. And these were coal burning engines. You went through maybe a half a mile of a tunnel in the mount through the mountains. And I don't know how many mountains that we went through that night. But anyway, they pulled us over at 11 o'clock because Chinese Czech Charlie was ro roaming around and they didn't want us to get bombed. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we stayed there until the morning, took off in the morning again. And about uh, four or five o'clock that day, we arrived at the Repel Depot where we all and I'm going to say a remark, and I don't mean uh, uh, to belittle anybody, but there wasn't one white guy in that whole goddamn crew got there when we got there. Right. We were suited down from the ashes from the from the coal engine. We didn't. We didn't. Our faces were totally black. Oh my God. Our clothes, everything. <coughs> and. <laughs> We had, were these like box cars they had you in, or no? They, they were passenger Regular cars, passenger but cars. they were passenger cars. But uh, however, they were uh, made over. There were bench seats. There was no cushions. There was no, you know, no windows. I have no idea why. Mm -hmm. We never asked, and we never got a, we never <laughs> got an answer. There was so. no glass in the windows, or there was no opening. The opening was there. There was no glass. Oh, in there was no glass. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Where, that's where all the smoke oh, okay. came in. Oh, that, yeah, that's kind of where I got. Got confused because I I thought you didn't have any oh, no, windows we, at all. You know? Oh no, we had uh, we had openings, but openings but no glass. Uh, so <laughs> glass. <laughs> I wouldn't care if it was boarded. It'd be really better than that. Boarded. <laughs> right. We had about throw our clothes away and uh, everything when we got oh, there. You'd never get them clean. Oh, I can imagine that would be yeah. something. Yeah. So the first order of business after we got there is that we got, we got uh, assigned and what they had. Uh, it was a, an artillery battalion, 49th, I was, this was the 49th Baker Company battalion of the, of the field artillery. And they had a maintenance tent that was had maybe about 
I would guess about 45 or 50 people, and they did all of the grunt work mm -hmm. for the for the battery. Okay, so I was assigned to the maintenance group, but uh, short maybe I didn't even uh, spend about a week there, and they knew that I had telegraphy uh, uh, experience. So what they said, okay. We put in wiring, so they put us a bunch of us out laying the wires for every tent that was in the uh, in the headquarters, hey, BOQ and the door, kitchen and all of those types of things. I only worked there a short time, and after we got all the wires laid, they made me a telephone operator. We had three eight-hour shifts, and I worked the midnight shift for answering any calls that would come in from headquarters, from the <coughs> Forward up service up front, calling in the ammo, you know, the, the artillery and that right. type of thing. So, I did. I guess I did that for about three or four weeks, and there was a lot of rotation going on during that time because all you had to do was accumulate nine points, four four points a month, and if you got nine months, you had thirty six points. You're eligible for a rotation back to the United States. So there was a lot of rotation happening and a lot of openings because of that. So the next thing that happened was uh, the uh, battery clerk got rotated to the United States and I was selected to take his place. So I was in that position I guess for maybe about, uh, oh, about three months and then the uh, supply sergeant, he went and he got uh, his points accumulated to 36, and he was rotated to the United States. Well, for some reason, the finger got pointed at me again to go ahead and take the supply sergeant's place. I, I don't know why. I have to this day, I, I have no idea why. During during this time, uh, what was kind of the, uh, uh, the the mindset or thinking of? The soldiers in Korea, it's like in the United States. Obviously, you know they they never actually declared the war as a Korean yeah, war right. was a conflict, and uh, uh, we had a, a neighbor uh, where I where I was uh, growing up, and uh, he was in the Korean conflict, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we were all concerned about him and so on and so forth. But it just you know the, it kind of went on, but it was not. Thought of in the same light as the Second World War, yeah. just that finished, you know, right. five or six years yeah. earlier. You right. know, it, the the urgency and the I would I won't say the support was lacking, but there wasn't as much support because I can recall, oh, no. you know, in the Second World War, the things that we did uh, yeah. to uh, you know conserve uh, tin cans yeah. and right. you know paper oh, yeah. drives and scrap <clears throat> iron drives and all those kinds of things air raid drills and yeah. so on and yeah. it was sort of like something was happening but it was far away yeah. and it wasn't a, going to affect us yeah that's true that, that type of thinking the uh, did, did they there was the, the there wasn't uh, any dissension or, or no they, I wouldn't say there was any dissension but I don't think there was the dissension came from the uh, the people from in World War two that were put in the five-year reserves. Okay. Those were the people that were dissenting. I never heard, I don't think, anything said by a one a person that was drafted or a person that signed up for the itself. But mm -hmm. all of the U.S. reserves, they were the ones that did the most bitching. Yeah, were, were recalled. Yeah. Well, why, why us again? You know, kind of a thing. Okay. Well, you signed up. You know. You, you know, you sign your name, yeah. but they didn't think that anything was, that was going to happen that, that fast. Yes. So that was the only dissension, really, that I ever ran into. Yeah. Okay, so then at, at that point you were, you were the supply sergeant, is that right? Yeah, we had to uh, make sure that uh, everybody had uh, what they call a T-O-N-E. That's a table of content for every soldier had to have a certain amount of clothing, you know, Parkas, field jackets, pile jackets, oh, everything. So the first step was uh, when I got into the supply sergeant was <coughs> to take an inventory of every body, which is about 156 people maybe in the battery, take an inventory of everything what they had. 
and go out then to the supply supplying agency and write an order to cover everybody in the whole battery so that they would have their correct clothing and everything for the coming Christmas or uh, coming uh, uh, winter because it got <coughs> the thing I remember the coldest I ever remembered it got 46 degrees below one night and we had 96 vehicles in the battery there was only one vehicle and that vehicle was a jeep that belonged to us would start in the morning if wow. the Koreans and the Japanese or the Co Koreans and the Chinese had to jump off that night we were we were doomed wow yeah one Jeep out of a 96 vehicles would start. Is that because they you weren't able to service them properly? No, or it, it, it got so cold. 46, just got, just got too 46 cold. degrees. It, it's just no way the oil the oil was like frozen uh -huh. in the Jeep. Wouldn't even turn the engine over. Yeah, because uh, well, they were all six volt ignitions in oh, those yeah. days, and yeah. didn't have near the jumping power yeah. you know, to get it yeah. started as That's you right. would have now. Luckily, we got uh, everything go going, though, you know, one vehicle jumping another and batteries right. and that type of thing. Ordering um, the, all those supplies and so on and so forth, uh, was that somewhat of an easy task? Because I know uh, it, many times they hand you something and, and they say, well, that's not my size. And I'll say, well, you'll, you'll grow into it or yeah. you'll, you'll lose weight or whatever, you know. And, uh, when the, when the, uh, all of the supplies came in, we notified each, like, uh, what we call a section at a time. Send your men up, and we got all their clothes. We'd have to have separate all the clothes that they didn't have on that inventory when you took the inventory the first time. Right. You had it all set off by name as to what they were getting. And really, there was no size to a parka. <laughs> it was, right. it yeah. was a big parka, and <laughs> yeah. it fit everybody. Right. And, and uh, I, I can remember uh, talking to the infantry people. When it got cold on the line at night, they threw their parkas in the fire to burn to keep warm. Mm. A lot of their clothing went in. Their, mm. their feet were freezing. They had combat boots on, not rubber boots or mm -hmm. in any kind, just regular combat boots that you had. Wow. Yeah. And, and so there was snow, a lot of snow as well? Oh yeah, yeah. We had, I think on Christmas Eve, I think there was something like 19 inches of uh, snow. Hmm. Yeah. 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 It was, it was, went from one extreme to the other. I guess I remember when it was 110 degrees in, in the summer in July, and I remember when it was 46 degrees below in <laughs> January. Wow. Now, now were these, uh, Troops in in barracks or were they in tents or no? Uh, the, they, 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 they were all in they were all in tents of, of a kind. There was one uh, tent that would hold like about thirty five or forty people. Then the um, the gunner gu gunnery crew did have tarps and everything all left over them so they could go in and keep warm. Right, you know that kind of thing. So everybody was had a protection of some kind during the winter. Now, now that, was this a uh, Area protecting something like uh, other other weapons or whatever, or where you were stationed, or or uh, well, or were you at? I mean, you weren't necessarily on the front lines, but yet you were. Well, in, we were in, all, you we were, were in combat, though. Yeah, we were always in combat, except for one month. In the month of September of '51, we were selected to be the honor guards over at the peace talks. So we spent one thirty days over there, but we went right back into action again as soon as we came out of that uh, honor guard uh, thing. That's the only time that I can remember that we were not supporting. We were supporting the 17th Regiment of okay. the 7th Division. Okay. Okay. And that was, that was supposedly be the best division and the best regiment in that division. They never lost a battle as, as long as we were over there. They were the ones that took <coughs> Port Chop Hill the night. Okay. That, that, that we, and that particular night, I remember, I, I, I was a battery clerk, and I had to keep track of how many uh, uh, weapon, how many uh, bullets or sh we shot yeah, at, yeah. Night, at night. Okay? The next morning when I was making out my report, I got the report from the uh, executive officer, I guess, that, the, uh, that was in charge of the uh, 105s. We sh 
shot over 24,000 rounds of ammunition that night. Wow. We had eight trucks from leaving the area down to the arsenal to pick up the ammo and just turn right back around again and took another trip. And every truck was full. Wow. That was the hottest night I've ever, ever, ever remember of, uh, you know, as far as the war was concerned. Well, so then you had to, to move with the troops? Is that is that the way it, it operated? Your, your, your support unit? No, the support unit was basically, uh, mo most times, they'd be off to a side and not shooting over like uh, the kitchen uh, tent or the right. BOQ or things like that. But they were in within walking distance of where we were all the time. Yeah. Wow. So that, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, then, uh, like, like you said, you, you were involved with the uh, Battle of Pritchard Hill. Yeah. Your, your outfit, at least. Yeah. And so forth. So. Yeah. Is that. Uh, hey, oh, excuse me. Sure. I just want to make one remark over here, something that uh, you might uh, think. Uh, when they, when that battle was won and that battle was over, there wasn't one green tree or anything on that hill. When they did a search, there was 30 inches of dust on that hill. That's how we got hard it got pounded wow. with, with the ammo. That 30, was 30 inches of dust. 30 inches of dust. I mean, there was nothing living at all, and it was 30 inches of dust, I guess, on that hill when they. Got all done firing all the artillery equipment in there. My. They had a, I don't know if you're familiar with artillery or not, but they had what we call a, an FO, forward observer. Okay. And he'd go up right on, on line, just across from, uh, and he'd be, do, be doing the calling in of the, the artillery. And he had a radio man with him, and there was the, both of them was, were there, and they, they uh, he called in all of the uh, ammo, all of the shells. Some of them ended up short. We we killed some of our own men. But they would they we heard about it, and just, there's nothing worse than that. No, there would there wouldn't be. I no, there that was be, not. That would be terrible. But I, I you know I've heard uh, a lot of that you know about in say World War Two and the yeah. and, and oh, Korean yeah. War and so on yeah. right? because you know those things happen. They don't have at that time, you know, the, the technology that we have now, we're now, you yeah. Could, oh, yeah. You, could, you could probably hit a person sitting in our chair, you oh, know, absolutely. If, you, if you wanted to. No, no question. But when that happened, we knew the the uh, colonel or the major would come down and he'd get everybody together. And he wouldn't say as much, maybe, that, you know, but he it would stress on the fact that, hey, be careful, you know, make, make sure you got the right estimate and everything else. When you're calling in for the firing of the artillery, mm -hmm. yeah, it was a shame. It really was. It was bad enough to go over there and lose your life uh, with the enemy, but when you go over and your own men, you know, made made an error yeah. and you know, uh, error and well, math or reading yeah, information or whatever. Yeah, whatever, yeah. It was it was sad. So, so then uh, when when you were overseas, did you have? Much contact with uh, you know the folks at home, because uh, I guess really your family was still in Canada. Is that, yeah, my, is that well, I had a, uh, a, a half of my family was in Detroit, Michigan. My brothers and sisters, and uh, the re remainder were in Nova Scotia. But uh, the only communication we had would be a letter. Mm -hmm. You could write a letter home to the, the people in Detroit or in Nova Scotia, but there was never any telephone. No, no, none whatsoever. Not to. I, I, that's why I was kind of thinking, you know, letter would be probably the only thing that you yeah, in those it, days that it you was, could have used. It was. My folks were, ex, were ex, uh, extremely, uh, you know, because of the two brothers being killed in the war and me getting in again, because the ruling in Canada was if you lost two sons in the war, another, another son would not see combat. Nice. So my folks were uptight about you know me being there and you know that kind of a thing. Yeah, you said earlier before we started about coming from a large family. Just t uh, tell us about that. It's just a, about your brother, if you you know, well, number of brothers, sisters you had. We're, we're born on a farm, and a farmer always needs a lot of help, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we had uh, 16 in the family. We had uh, 
I guess it was seven boys and uh, six girls. My dad was married twice. His first wife died after five children, okay? And those children basically got uh, adopted by uh, his brother and his, his sisters, okay? But then he got married again, and uh, there was one of the oldest of the uh, first family still home. And we had uh, 11 children from the uh, last family. There were six boys and five girls. Oh. Yeah. The large... There was never a moment of uh, silence or... <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was talking. <laughs> yeah. We had a great time on the farm, though. We really did. So then, uh, did your uh, brothers, or the ones that were in here in, in Michigan, did they come about the time that you did, or were they here beforehand? Uh, uh, they were here... Or, uh, Every one of them except two were here before me, okay? Yeah, two of them came after I came in. Okay. And did, did they come on their own, so to speak? Oh, yeah, they came on their own, yeah. They, yeah. they, they, they weren't transferred through, no, uh, no, through no. a job or something? No, no. They worked in, auto, in, in uh, with an auto, uh, automobile factory making parts or something first, uh, and then they were, went into teaching and doing you know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to, for at least for me, uh, to, to hear how people end up where they are, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Because uh, my grandparents, they came from England mm -hmm. to uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, and were married there, and they ended up in Canada. Yeah. And then uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and yeah. then over to Vancouver, and my grandfather uh, went to Florida in the middle 20s because that was the big land rush oh yeah and he didn't uh he didn't like the people there or whatever he stopped in uh, cincinnati to see his as he called his old maid uh cousins or whatever yeah. on the way back to vancouver and he liked cincinnati so well so he said i'm going to move my family to cincinnati and that's that's where i grew up oh, is that in, right? in that area and you know they came from like you from, yeah from canada oh yeah he was in there Royal Canadian Army, yeah. Oh, yeah. the First World War, yeah. and so forth, and uh, you know it's it's very 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 interesting to see how oh, people yeah. end up and then yes, or or get transplanted yeah, yeah. to different parts of the, of the yeah. country and so forth. So My mother's brother, he was uh, in this World War Two. He got gassed, but not that badly. But uh, he he did get gassed and. Uh, but he came and uh, he came back and he went to work in the gold mines in Timmins, Ontario, for about forty years. Over over there. <laughs> so finally, you you were able to be rotated, right? After you got your thirty six. Well, uh, no, there was another step. Right. Uh, after uh, the uh, supply sergeant, uh, would you believe that the first sergeant uh, rotated of the whole battery? Oh. And. The finger got pointed at me again. I have no idea why. I, I have no idea what what was going on. Who who was doing the selection or ending? But I I got promoted to master sergeant of the whole uh, battery. About uh, I would guess it was sometime around uh, February of '51. Yeah. Well, that was really. Fast advancement, really. Yeah, yeah. As I say, I, I well, you never know who's watching. I guess. No, you know? I guess not. I never did get in trouble. I, you know, I did what I was told, and uh, when, once you do those things, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you're not. I never got in any trouble, so neither did a lot of other people. But uh, well, and, and you probably uh, took on tasks too that uh, some were somewhat difficult. Yeah. You know, you yeah. Know, and, so, well, so on and so forth. I think the supply thing, uh, supply sergeant, and uh, you know, filling that order of clothing and making sure everybody, everybody kind of looked at that and says, hey, you know, that's my the only thing I can recall. That's mm -hmm. why they would uh, point a finger at me for first sergeant. So then, uh, as yes, you were the the first sergeant. Then uh, you got your you did away with the supply. Oh yeah, yeah. Duties and so, so on and yeah. so forth. So then you were. Pretty much the first sergeant for the whole outfit. Is yeah, that for the whole said? outfit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so that would be a res big responsibility. Then, at that point, then did you go out on uh, combat missions, or were you no, in the uh, we, same we, we basically we basically only moved about uh, 
three times into a combat area. Of the whole 12 months we were there, we spent that one month as the Peace Honor Guards right. at Pan Munchan. But otherwise, they would move us based upon where the heaviest battle maybe was taking place. And they wanted some additional artillery fire. So th we only moved about three times. And that's about the only time we were ever not in combat was during the time we were at Pan Munjan. I see. Yeah. Yeah. You, did you ever uh, sustain any injuries, you know, in, in, in battle, you know, get wounded? No, the only, the only thing that happened was we were, in, <laughs> we were in the line for chow one day, and I don't know, there was a plane flying above, and I don't know if he lost a, a piece of fuselage or something, but it hit the guy in the back. In the back got a purple heart. <laughs> oh, <laughs> a purple heart. For him. <laughs> we all thought that was pretty funny. Oh, oh, oh. That's as bad as some of the stories you hear about uh, some of the officers that wanted to see their men get medals or whatever, and somebody had trip and yeah. you know scuff their their elbow or something, and yeah. they get a purple heart. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we can we see your picture for the? For the video camera. Yeah, why don't you hold that up? Yeah, that's now, a, now that is when is that when you first? No, that's when he's master. That's no, that's, that's what, oh, when I was master. No. I had two more stripes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And okay. I had a diamond tilt in it, the middle. Tilt it. Yeah. Tilt it that tilt, way. Tilt it over that yeah. way, if you would. Yeah. 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 So that's right. when you were a sergeant. Yeah. This is when I was a supply sergeant. Supply sergeant. Right. Okay. What were your duties as first sergeant? First sergeant. Well, okay. you made darn sure that any of the uh, orders that came out of the, uh, uh, from the captain was, uh, con uh, was known by all of the people in the battery. Any, any orders or anything new or news or whatever, it was always communicated via, through the first sergeant into all the rest of the people. Okay? <clears throat> yep. You had all the other sergeants below you, and so on. So. Yeah, right. All the others, everybody, uh, everybody below me. Uh. Were these uh, like castles, like they used them? Uh, yeah, capulets or something. Yeah, for the for the uh, for the engineer for the combat. I, I, I think it was. Yeah. This, see, this is the seventh division uh, insignia here. The hourglass. Okay. Okay. And these were look look like capulets, but uh, as I say, I have no idea. I have no idea when this picture was taken to tell you the truth. I don't know if it was at, in Korea at home or. Uh, well, it would have been in, in. I would say in Korea because you know you. Yeah, you, it you had, had to be in Korea. You had a rank yeah, and uh, so had. on. So maybe, maybe that was. Did you go to the honor guard? Maybe at that time, it could have maybe been. they took photos, and uh, they, pro they probably did, because I'm sure they would want to want that information. Yeah, it could have been, mm -hmm. because I had two stripes after this, so it had to be taken in Korea. Mm -hmm. So when you went to the Honor Guard, it, you went along with that? Oh, that yes. Correct? Oh, yes. Yeah. Captain, the whole, the whole company, 150-some people uh, <coughs> went, went over as Honor Guards. How, how, how did that go during like the negotiations and so forth? I have no idea. All of a sudden the captain just came down and says, we've been selected to be the honor guard. No, no, I meant uh, when, when you were there, was that something that uh, seemed like the process went pretty smooth, you know, with the negotiations and so on that were going oh, yeah. on? Or yeah. did you know anything about that? So no, that, no, you know, we didn't were, know anything was were, happening in the building at all. Mm -hmm. We just did whatever our captain wanted us to do. Basically, all we did was play volleyball. <laughs> I think it was more of a 30-day rest than anything else, uh -huh. you know. But we had to wear certain red bands and stuff like that to show that we were the honor guards for the peace talks. Well, that was good because yeah. you know you were, you know, getting a little bit of R and R. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, they let you go on. They let you go on R and R and. Korea, they, they had a, a, a hotel and they'd send you down for five days. Everybody would take a turn rotating, they'd go right through the whole, the whole battery and you got to stay, to stay down about three or four nights, you know, which is good. Is that something you had to pay for or did no, no. the military no. do that for you? No, 
The only problem was when we went down there, you never know who you're going to get thrown in with. And in a room, there was about four or five people sleeping. And another guy and I woke up about two o'clock in the morning, and here was a guy trying to crawl out the window. Going off. He had a bad, he was an infantryman, uh -huh. and he had one of his bad dreams, I yeah. guess. And he was, we grabbed him, we grabbed him coming out of, uh, trying to get out of the, uh, I don't know how many, yeah, four or five he, stories. He had, up. had a nightmare, yeah. Yeah, he had a nightmare, and we grabbed him and pulled him back down. That's the thing. There, there's so many stories like like you just mentioned that uh, the the rest of the world aren't aren't aware of. Oh no! You know, absolutely and, uh, not. There's you, people you, coming back that uh, you know that they're just having one heck of a time, exactly. fitting back into the life that they had before they left. Exactly. Because of what they've done. And uh, that that is a shame. It really is. It, it, it really is. It just. Uh, I don't think there's enough indoctrination by the government to help these people out. You know, uh, they, they can test them and they, they can find out if there's a problem or even if there's a problem, set up an organization that they can go to and, you know, see if they can't get rid of that. Right. There, you know, there should be a, a way when they get home that, like you yeah. say, that they can have some ongoing uh, treatment if necessary, or, or, or and then you it's just, assistance and what have yeah. you. You know that they're there today, and uh, be, they, they, you know for years they've been there. You know, not being able to settle back into life. Exactly. Yeah. That's a shame. So anyway, then um, wh when did you end up uh, leaving Korea? Do you recall? Yeah, I left uh, Korea on uh, in April of uh, fifty-two. Two. Yeah. Okay. I was I I, I extended <coughs> over three months because when I found out that I had to go to Camp Carson, Colorado, if I had more than three months left, I didn't want to go to Camp Carson, Colorado. Mm -hmm. I wanted to stay in Michigan, so I stayed an extra three months, and then I rotated and I went to Battle Creek after my delayed en route when I came back to the United States, and I got discharged out of. Uh, Battle Creek, Michigan. Oh, okay. So they, what did they have there? Uh, what type of a uh, that, that that basically was uh, the discharge center for uh, the, uh, everybody in Michigan. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, well, but if you came back then in in April or so, you you uh, were discharged like in October. Is that right? Yeah, I think it was uh, the tenth, the ninth or the tenth of October. I got I got discharged. So, yeah. Where, where were you in the meantime? Like in, in we'd come home on the weekend to Detroit, and then we'd drive back on Sunday night uh, to, and we'd be there all Monday through Saturday, and then leave again. That that kind of a thing. But all we did was we we went police action. I see. Remember that picking yeah. up cigarette butts, yeah. <laughs> with papers and stuff. Yeah. So there was really nothing going on in those three months. That uh, okay. Okay. Well, then, um, once you were, were out of the service, did you uh, do anything as far as like with a GI Bill or any of those things? Yeah, or, uh, I, uh, I uh, didn't do anything uh, with the GI Bill until I, I, had, I went back to work for GM for about uh, a year. And then I went to work for a construction, sand, blast, sand blasting and steam cleaning. We, we did the, um, you know, the big uh, tankers, oil tankers and the coal. Mm -hmm. we, we'd go down on the fort hold maybe down and sandblast all of that stuff off. Or we'd go up on a, on a like a Catholic church. You know what, you know St. Leo's Catholic Church is at, uh, on Grand River? No, so I'm not okay. from this area, oh, really. Okay. And uh, so I, some of those spots I don't we know. We sandblast it, or we uh, steam clean that building. I see. You wore a fisherman's, you wore a fisherman's suit? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we wore that. 90 degree heat <laughs> with the 212 degree uh, water. Wow. And, and big sulfuric acid cleaning the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then that ended. Uh, we, our, our work is pretty seasonal in the uh, construction. You know, it, by the time October, November came, it was too cold to work outside right. and that kind of a thing. So I uh, went, I got married, and I uh, went out, uh, put an application in at Chrysler 
um, in November. I got married on the 23rd of October in uh, 1923. Am I married? No, 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 no. I'm 57 years married. <laughs> so, 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 somebody so, so, so uh, in 53. Yeah, 1953, yeah. So early, then I went to work for time, Chrysler yeah. and I worked at the, in the plant for about a year. And uh, I started, I went to, I got the GI Bill and I went to tech school, technology, radio, te television, calculus, <coughs> that kind of a thing. Well, it got to the point of where uh, working at Chrysler, I had to give up going to school because I was working sometimes 10, 12 hours a day, maybe two shifts, you know, that kind of right. a thing. So I uh, got from Chrysler's plant, I went into the data processing, into the computer system, okay? And I was there for 34, 34 years, up to 34 years and 11 months that I was at Chrysler, I worked with computers. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were in the computers then when they were most of the size of this room. Oh, <laughs> this, this room wouldn't even fit them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we had, we had uh, punch cards. I don't know if you remember right. Remy mm -hmm. the Run, yeah, yeah, punch remember, cards. I remember that well. Yeah. So yeah. I worked at GM and... Uh, in our office in, was in Charleston, West Virginia, we had they built a special room and oh, gosh. oh the air machine, the, the machine that was in there, my lord, it looked like a you had false flooring, I'll bet you too, like right? A, like a freight train, it was yeah. so big. Oh yeah, no. But I, I wasn't involved in that. But they had the ladies had special training and oh, they, they, they treated, treated it like a. A hazardous yeah. area or whatever. <laughs> Today, for crying out loud, the, the megabyte, we, we used to have what they call four megabyte uh, bytes of information, and that would be about maybe five feet across and seven feet tall. Today, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a little thing. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. it's called your cell phone. It's just, yeah, yeah, really just a different world. Yeah, different world entirely. So, so then, uh, the and it, did you ever do anything else then with your uh, with your education? You know, from the, the no, GM not bill? really. I uh, when I retired from Chrysler, I retired in Chrysler in 1989. I'm 22 years retired now, and uh, I went to work for a um, a robotics firm, and they were in the process of wanting to replace their computer. So I was put in charge of the whole uh, computer, mm -hmm. ordering it, getting it in, getting the people from the company to come in for the training of the personnel and what have you. So I worked at that uh, the first time for about a year before we got the <coughs> thing all set, everything get set and ready to go. Then five years later they were ready to move again. So they went. They called me. <coughs> excuse me. They called me again. So we've changed everything all over again with because you had to keep up with that technology. Exactly. Yeah. And after that, I went. My my son is in a uh, a radiator repair repair business, and I drive. I've driven to trucks, pick up delivery for him. Huh. You know. So I do. I do odd work here, here and there, and what have you. Did you uh, join any of the? Uh, Veterans groups? No, uh, I didn't. I, uh, <coughs> no, I never did. Okay, I just wondered about that. Yeah. And see, did you hit any indicator? No, no. Okay. Well, my, my medals I give to my grandson. I only got one boy as a as a grandson. All the oh. rest of them are girls. Oh. So how, I give. How, I give how, how, how many children do you have? Because you mentioned you were got married. Ten. Wow. So you have, you have ten children, and how many grandchildren then? Just got ten. They don't, they don't do it the way they used to do it. Well, you, you have 10 yeah. children and 10 grandchildren? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought maybe I misunderstood what no. you said. No. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> ten, 10 children back but you, then. But, it's but it's you, two and three today. But yeah, but, <laughs> but, you, but you still have a, a good sized family. That is yeah, sure. well, the baby is 43 years old, and the uh, <coughs> oldest is 56. She's retired from. From uh, Ford, it took a retirement, and she's back out working again. Though they're all involved in different things. I got a son that's a chef. He te te teaches chef uh, right now. Oh, is that right? Yeah, he went to uh, 
Culinary Institute in, uh, in Hyde Park, New York for two years. Yeah. Well, it's only got a very nice family. Thank you. Well, sir. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. When, when did you become a U.S. citizen? You mentioned that was after you came I, back from Korea. I came back in October. I got discharged in October, and I think by January, February of the next year, I had I had to go downtown to the immigration office, and they give you a book based upon all the questions that they might ask you when you go in for your final uh, citizenship papers. Yeah. But they made it a lot easier on veterans. If if I wasn't a veteran, and if I went down there, I would have had to have. Uh, three sessions covering five years before I could get my citizenship papers and I had to answer all those questions correctly on the fifth year or they send you back and till you uh, passed it the test so it took me about three months from the time that I got my book until the time I got my citizenship papers but the other thing that was funny you know we're talking about the fact that uh, they, I, they never knew until I got to Port Sheridan, Illinois, that I was a uh, uh, an alien. Yeah. And it never it, it never came out. Okay. But the funny part of it was I don't want this to go into, into the <laughs> anywhere other than maybe <laughs> you and I and the rest of the people. <laughs> but uh, they uh, paid the uh, the uh, yeah, the service service people. Mm -hmm. The state of Michigan paid three hundred dollars to everybody that served in the Korean War. That was the only time they found out I was an alien. <laughs> I never did get it. You're kidding? No, I never did get it. <laughs> so nope, never got it. So, so once you put your life on the line, they don't ask. But when they're going to pay you some money, all of a sudden. But the it's funny part of it was they put me in the in the U.S. Uh, and they put me in the reserves for five years. And I wasn't a citizen. <laughs> but yet I, well, I wasn't worth $300. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I thought that was funny. Well, and, yeah. too, if anybody heard that nowadays, they say $300, that didn't mean anything. But in those days, that was a lot of money. You, know? <laughs> you better believe it was a lot of money. In the early you know. 50s, that's well, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But, uh, oh. Well, is there any, anyone else have any questions? No, no really. It was, it was interesting. interesting. Um, is there anything that you could think of that you'd like to add uh, about, you know, about your life or no, family or anything? What was the robotics company that you did the computer work for? Pardon me? What was the robotics company you did the computer work oh, for? Oh, sign company. They were over at, you know where the Air Force Base is at, the Selfridge? Yeah. Okay, they were the, the, the second building away from the fence, from the gate, ah. okay? That's, that's where they were, yeah. But they, they, they got bought out by mm -hmm. Ampinol and Sign Company mm -hmm. in Michigan is really nothing yeah. anymore. They, they, they closed yeah. that plant yeah, down sure. and everything. Yeah. No, I'm happy that I went to Korea and uh, served my time. Nobody can ever say that, hey, you know, you shirked your duty or right. whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of a thing. And it was, happy. It was, a, it was a pleasant time really in my life. Well, so, that was a different time in the country, too. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, very and, definitely. And I, when we got into the, I guess, the Vietnam situation, that's when started to be a lot of upheaval oh. and unrest yeah. about serving and well, you know, I not, mean, not, all not the, all supporting the it and everything. Yeah. All, all the citizens and the people of the United States were yelling at them, killing their kids in Vietnam yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. And, you know... It, they didn't stand for back for a minute and say, "Hey, you know, those people were forced to go over there." Yeah, that's not their responsibility. You know, they had to do what they had to do. Yeah. But oh, they had, it was bad when they they came back from Vietnam. Yeah. I felt sorry for them. Really did. We didn't have the same when we came back from Korea at all. No. I, I never ran into anything like that. Not I, because I, I, I was not. <clears throat> <clears throat> that old uh, to, to really m remember a whole lot about the Korean War, but uh, what I can recall, I mean, there was no animosity, and everyone no. was behind it, it was, but it was not, like I say, it was not anything like the, no, the Second I, World War, no, but uh, no. at least there was not any anyone, uh, you know, yeah. 
<laughs> well, Hitler was ready to take over the world. That was one thing. The Koreans weren't ready to take over anything except that they were trying to hold to this, to their own the land or whatever. Yeah. And the Chinese and the North Koreans uh, wanted to take it away from them. But uh, it was, in one respect, it was a good thing that it was far removed from us. We had enough injuries and uh, killings and everything in World War Two and World War One. I was happy to see that it's isolated and the only people that really could get killed would have been the people that were drafted or, or joined and were sent over there. But you take World War II and all the people that was killed, the civilians that were killed in England and, you know, all over, you know. The, what, uh, like, was the, the attraction on the other side of the 38th parallel that the one side wanted versus the other, or what have you. There really wasn't. The only, the only, the only thing that was different with the uh, north uh, of the par 38 parallel, for some reason they elected that that would be the demar demarcation line. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that was different on the other side of the line is the mountains were higher and there was more of them. There was, you know, the, and uh, if you had a cow or a horse in Korea, either South or North Korea, you were rich. You know. So, uh, I guess, like the North wanted all the land in the South, and the South wanted all the land in the North, is that pretty well, much the way it was? Or? The, north is, the North was the people that wanted the South. Okay. The South says, hey, we're going to protect everything from the 38th parallel, and you guys stay where the heck you're at, because the South was, uh, they had some, you know, they had Seoul, was kind of a uh, industrial uh, city, you know, things of that nature. But there was nothing in the North in North Korea. I don't think except rice, rice and mountains and uh, trees. Okay. Yeah. So very, they, very so they were kind of just protecting what they had and That's not right. not wanting to get more. That's they just right. wanted to yeah. stay where they were, so yep. to speak. You didn't have any uh, flooring except mud in your uh, where you stayed, and you attached you had attached roof for your for your shelter at, at in the winter. Can you imagine how severe the winter can get? Yes. And it it, it, was, it really was horrible. Yeah. Well, uh, we really enjoyed having you today, and again, I want to thank you for your we appreciate your service to the country to our country. No. See if you can get me my $300. That's a request then, and maybe somebody you want that with at, the, at the Library of Congress will, uh, will look at this and uh, <laughs> send you a check. So, yeah, yeah. A little, a little Boy, related. That would shock me. <laughs> well, sir, you have our respect. That'll have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.